Hi everyone and welcome to episode 16 of the Life in Norway show. This week I'm joined by another American living in Norway. Elizabeth Ramsey is the director of Blank Space Oslo, an ambitious art collective and creative space in the Norwegian capital. We chat about what brought Liz to Norway, what the creative communities of Scandinavia are like, how locals can get involved with the projects at Blank Space, and some places for fans of art and design to visit while you're in town. Liz is also a fellow podcaster. She hosts the monthly Blank Space podcast, Blah Blah, which discusses topics as diverse as illustration, silkscreen printing, augmented reality, and video game development. You can find out more about Blank Space Oslo and everything we talk about on today's show on the show notes page at lifeinnorway.net forward slash podcast. Happy listening. I'd like to welcome Liz Ramsey to the latest episode of the Life in Norway show. She is the director of Blank Space Oslo, a proactive art collective in the Norwegian capital. Liz, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Not a problem at all. Uh, first question, which I ask everybody, especially, of course, the foreigners on the show. What brought you to Norway and where are you from originally? I mean, this is kind of the question that we all get, isn't it? It's like you have you have like two, three questions that like <laughs> that like uh, it's like, oh, what brought you to Norway? And then like, oh, and then it's always how do you like it here? Yeah, like the absolutely. second question is always, always, oh, do you like it? I mean, what do you like about Norway? But anyways, yeah, I... Uh, my husband is Norwegian. Uh, we met in San Francisco where I studied for about six and a half years. We both studied art, uh, moved here about six years ago now. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I like to say the simple answer is that it was my husband. It was love that brought me here, but Mm. I also kind of knew that there was a place for me in Norway, like uh, specifically working within art and design like I do, I, I kind of felt that there was a Liz-shaped hole in Norway that I could that I could fill pretty pretty nicely. Now, it didn't work out like I had planned, but that was the initial intention was, I'm a strong, independent woman. I'm not just moving here for love and a man, but also because I have a purpose and I have a reason and but it was it was it was love. Sure. Okay. Burning <laughs> burning question from me then. San Francisco, I think everybody knows wherever they are in the world, it's a whether it's whether it's moved on from being a hippie hub like it was decades ago, it's still yeah. a, a real center of art, design and creativity. I think it oh, has yeah. that reputation. Oslo doesn't really have that reputation. Scandinavia in, in general, perhaps it's known for, you know, product design maybe, but mm. when it comes to art and artists, it's it's not the first place that springs to mind. So what is the art and design community in Norway and Oslo specifically like? Well, for me, I mean, it's definitely when you talk about Scandinavian design, there is this kind of idea of minimalism that pops up. Like if you think of kind of the square Ikea furniture, like there's, there's, it's not ornate, it's not very detailed. Um, and that translates a little bit as well into the design scene where people tend to work with images that are a bit simpler, they are a bit more uh, stylized. But I mean, you can't really compare San Francisco specifically to any other city because it is a unique, I mean, it's it's almost like a moth to a flame, like people who are artistic just flock to San Francisco because they don't, it's like a natural thread that they just get pulled by. Um, and I think people come to Norway and also specifically for different reasons. Uh, it has kind of this in-between feeling of being in between being a big capital hub and being like a small town. Mm. (laughs) And so everybody else, like if you're from a small town in Norway or from a small town elsewhere, um, then it can feel amazing to be an awful, like, wow, like we've finally come to a big city. Um, But then you come from a place like San Francisco and you're like, oh my goodness, like this is so much smaller than (laughs) than like what I was kind of used to. Was it a bit of a shock when you first moved to Oslo? Perhaps there was a bit of traveling before you actually decided to up sticks and move here. But was the reality of living in what Norwegians call the big city, but what everyone else calls a small town? um, How was that? I mean, 
for me, because we talk about culture shock quite a bit, especially when you're moving places, people like, like, oh, how are you acclimating? Was there a culture shock? And I don't think I ever got shocked because Norway is fairly similar to the U.S. in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, you have subways, you have McDonald's, you have Starbucks, you have people who speak English. Uh, and so I think in the beginning, I I didn't really realize I was in a different place for a while. Like I was just kind of involved with different things. I kind of did the regular immigrant route where I volunteered at different places, where I helped out with different projects, just kind of tried to build my network. And on the surface, everything was very, very similar. And it wasn't until I slowly got to know the system better um, of like living in a socialist uh, democratic country and uh, just living in Norway and all the cultural differences that it kind of was almost like a slow poison where like, (laughs) I joke it would have been easier for me to have moved here from, uh, from almost like China where it'd be vastly different Mm. Uh, because then from day one, you would like know that you're in a different place. But for me, it almost kind of felt more that I was like standing on top of a a poor foundation where I thought I understood what was going on when in reality, I really didn't. It was just shallow, like the label on top was the same, but underneath was different content. That's really interesting. So when you talk about these differences, is it related to society or are there differences within creativity itself between the US or, or Americans and Scandinavians? Well, I think people, one of the biggest misconceptions people make about art and design is like they, they think it's something completely different where like all like, your art and design community, your scene is going to be influenced by your society and by your culture. Right. Uh, and so those two things are, they're quite linked. And so the fact that we have a different culture and background and politics and you know, a stipend system in the US compared to Norway, like that's going to create a very different type of person, a very different type of artist. Uh And so being in Norway, like there is, like if we take a very concrete example of the stipend system of how artists get money, Hmm. uh, if we look at the U.S., there almost isn't any, especially looking at our political system that we have now where art and design is not prioritized. (laughs) There's many things that aren't prioritized right now in in the U.S. in politics. Um, But you come to Norway and there's there's a huge amount of money that's available from public, uh, public sources, whether it be at a national level or at a community level or, and the difference that's actually pretty prevalent is that in Norway, things are the overall mentality that I have found is that there is power in the many versus the power of one. Like in the U S you're kind of building rock stars, like you're building superstars, you're bu- you're building Michael Jackson's, you're building Elvis Presley's, like you're building these people that change the world but in Norway, there's much more of a mentality of individual projects of 10,000 individual people, individual projects, building a community, building a society through small contributions. Like, uh, and so in the stipend system, they they don't work a lot with, uh, with uh, institutions or organizations. There is a lot more, uh, what do you call it, like it's balanced in a way that individual projects get prioritizations and stipends mm. than like larger institutions, it kind of feels a little bit more that, yeah, that they're, that they're, they want more people to succeed in smaller tasks and then building this positive foundation that they can then build upon themselves. Whereas in the U S you're kind of, you, you have to struggle a little bit more, you know, (laughs) you have to like be hungry for the, for your field and then you have the passion and then you go further. Mm. So here in Norway, we very much look at the idea of the the collective being more important as the individual. That's certainly the the reputation. To what extent do you see that reflected in the art that is produced? Is there any repression on individual expressionism or is it the complete opposite? No, I think that Norway is actually one of the few countries that I've been to that like every person you meet believes that art has a place in life, like whether it be going to individual markets and like buying just something for 200 crowns um, or it's, you know, going to a gallery opening on the weekends, even if you're not going to buy anything, you just go to the opening. Like there has been this idea that art and culture is very important for daily life. People go to theater, people go to museums, people, people, even they don't, they believe that their taxes should go towards supporting these things. Mm. Uh, And so that's pretty incredible. However, 
there does come to be quite a bit of, I don't want to say oppression necessarily, but there is kind of a, a streamlined consciousness that comes uh, in a society that is quite uniformed. Uh, Norway is a very organized country. There's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of multiple choice questions. And so when you have a field like art that cannot be answered by a multiple choice question, it, it, it needs a short essay <laughs> to mm -hmm. explain, uh, it can be kind of hard to create institutions or to create uh, collectives almost, if you want, um, based upon certain aspects of art and design. It kind of just gets clumped into, we support art. And then you have like the artist's house. And even though they specialize in a certain type of art, there's not really any other funding or any other, um, what do you call it? like any other movements that are happening to represent other types of art uh, than like what everyone kind of agrees on. I see. Uh, I hope that I'm making sense. Like take, for example, like Norway, they really like contemporary art. Uh, they like contemporary design. Uh, but if you wanted to create a, uh, a video game, for example, that is still art, like undeniably, but there's going to be so many fewer resources for you to be able to learn how to create uh, art in that field than there would be if you wanted to create performance pieces or installation pieces. Mm. On the topic of contemporary art, uh, Oslo in particular is is known, of course, for its sculpture parks or its sculptures mm -hmm. in general, but its sculpture parks and uh, the Royal Palace, of course, uh, there's some new fairy tale themed sculptures there. But the one I'm interested in, in getting your opinion on is the one up uh, on the east side of the uh, city. I uh, feel a bit bad, but I don't even remember its name off the top of my head. Are you thinking about Ekeberg? <laughs> Ekeberg Park, of course I am. Yeah, um, I will also tell you, I, I haven't I haven't been there. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So it's perhaps know, not been... the best question, but that caused <laughs> a fair bit of controversy because, you know, the sculptures are, shall we say, an adult theme uh, to yeah. them. Um, do, does the community in Oslo, anyone you speak with on a day-to-day -day basis, have much of an opinion ab about uh, those sculptures and, and what people have to say in general about that sculpture park? No, I haven't heard too many opinions uh, that have been super strong one way or the other. But again, the artwork that I tend to work with tends to be on the alternative field. So it's a lot more things like illustration, animation, mm. video games, comic books, uh, these kinds of things. And I think when I typically hear people in those fields complain about the sculpture park in general, it's kind of just how they complain about fine art, period. Uh, you know, they, they complain about artwork that's more conceptually focused than skill-based, for example. So I don't think it necessarily has anything to do with Ekebadig itself, but more that they just have an opinion about that type of art. Okay, that uh, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that Norway is less, they shy away uh, less from artwork that is controversial. Um, like things that do have to deal with uh, mortality, with sex, with... Um, you know, gay pride, like all the, like they don't, it's almost hard to be controversial in Norway. Mm. Uh, unless you say something bad about Norway, then suddenly it's very, everyone is like, what? <laughs> 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 but yeah, but it's really hard, I think, actually, for an artist to be controversial in Norway because Norwegians tend to be quite liberal. Sure, sure. Okay, so you moved to Norway around six years ago. Uh, did you come up or did you move to Norway with the idea for blank space Oslo or is that something that developed uh, in those first few years that you were living here? Well I always had a kind of this idea uh, that I wanted to start a space of some kind. Uh, I thought it was going to be way more like the typical model where you have like a where artists have their kind of atelier, they have their studios mm. and then of those people who have studios you have classes and workshops and um, uh, so I was not anticipating that it would be such a huge project. I mean, Blank Space is now, it's, I mean, it's, it's big. It's, it's overwhelmingly big for me even. Um, so why and, don't you just take this opportunity to tell us a bit about it? We haven't really defined what it is yet. Yeah. Which, which this is, I haven't figured out our elevator pitch yet and <laughs> here's an um, opportunity to practice <laughs> yeah like uh, i apologize in advance of my monologue about what we do uh in short we're divided up into four separate kind of departments if you will okay um, and each one of them have equal force uh, so we focus on all of them equally um, and this idea is that then through these four different departments we're actually able to support the art design scene in norway completely from mm. beginners all the way through complete professionals 
so we work simultaneously with people who are uh, have never picked up a pencil but have always been curious about learning how to draw all the way through people who are absolute nerds who just love art who live and breathe design who you know <laughs> like are really into it in these four different departments is uh, we have uh, education and so we have classes that vary all the way from complete beginners to again the the nerds and then we have our exhibition so we have a full gallery that does about six exhibitions a year uh, all by kind of invitation only or concept based shows um then we also have our co-working space. And so we have about 60, 70 artists now who rent with us, uh, who have their studios here, either from a complete private room to just coming on the weekends kind of thing. And then the last part would be our community, where we do basically anything that could be supporting the art and design community, anything from portfolio reviews to having classes talking about how to do your taxes as a freelance illustrator to having our own podcast, uh, mm. which we do monthly talking to artists and designers. Uh, so we can do everything in art and design. Uh, we're a very why not kind of project where people have an idea and it's exciting. And as an institution, we have more power to do things than an individual who just wants to have a class or wants to, to have an exhibition. Sure. That's uh, an impressive number of people that you've got involved over the years. Uh, is it yeah. mostly Norwegians or do you have uh, expats and foreigners joining you either permanently or for periods of time as well? I mean, I would say at this point it's about 50-50 because we are one of the only places that advertises in English. And that started off with because I couldn't speak Norwegian. Mm. Uh, and then it slowly developed into actually almost a marketing strategy because there's so many immigrants who do get left out. Uh, and they are the people who are almost the most hungry for events, for hobbies, for things to do. Uh, and so being able to target them kind of from the beginning has been a huge influx in why we've been successful, because you have all these bigger institutions who are like vehemently sticking to Norwegian, and then they're missing out on 33% of the population in Oslo mm. uh, who are immigrants who maybe have a varying degree of of Norwegian. Like I speak Norwegian fluently now, but I still prefer reading in English. My brain naturally is going to read uh, Facebook posts in English, whereas I kind of just keep scrolling when it's in Norwegian, even though I understand what it's saying. What sort of a person uh, attends or rents space with you? I mean, what is the definition here of art and design? Are we talking about painters, creators? Is it very, uh, or is the definition very loose? So are people like writers or architects or, as you said earlier, video game designers welcome as well? What, what What's the sphere here? Well, I think for us, for me to answer that question accurately, I have to kind of divide up the different segments of what we do. Hmm. Uh, because for blank space as a whole, uh, the majority of our audience is between, you know, 20 to 35. Uh, they're typically female. They're typically like, it's basically me, uh, right. is like our, our, which shouldn't be a surprise for people who recognize marketing. Like you tend to market towards yourself. Um, but then people who are renting with us, for example, uh, we try to be a bit stricter with people who come down to rent with us specifically because we're trying to build a, an uh, actual community. So people who are willing to actually be here, you know, three, four or five days a week and working versus just kind of coming on the weekends. Uh, and we try to kind of curate people who specifically work with an art and design. So we might not have so many people on the tech side of things. We might not have people who are so much involved in the, the finance side of things. So it's a lot of video game developers, a lot of illustrators, a lot of animators, comic book artists, we have some fashion and jewelry designers. We have music producers and we have writers. We've also got a few, uh, uh, I call them mad scientists. Like we have a few like um, uh, robot builders or makers or people who have all these kind of big machines and equipment that build things. Um, <laughs> I asked them what they want to be called and they told me to say robot builders. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what they do completely. <laughs> but it's always something that's involved in the creative side of things. So we don't really have any lawyers or bitcoin traders or anything like that yeah yeah sure okay so 
If somebody is making art and design their full-time profession, there's obviously a, a place at blank space for them. What mm. about the average person who's living in Oslo? Maybe they're, they're working for the public sector. They have a, you know, a, a, an interest in, in illustrating on the side and they want to meet oh, yeah. a few people and so on. How does the, the average person get involved in, in your projects? Well, this is a really great question because this is actually the majority of the people who come to Blank Space. We have a very firm following of kind of, you know, like I said, nerds, people who are really interested in art. Um, but we try to have a vernacular, try to have a um, like how we speak in a way that is very easy for people to get involved. Like we're not pretentious. We're not condescending. We're not using big words. I guess outside of using the word vernacular, <laughs> um, like, <laughs> like, uh, like we try to keep things very, very accessible. And that's half of what we do is really just trying to get the average person to recognize that like, you don't have to be a professional artist to take, to like take a class. Uh, art is one of these few things that like people almost refuse to believe can just be a hobby. The second somebody's good at making a painting it's like people immediately ask, oh, like, why don't you sell this? Like, why don't you, why aren't you going to markets and, and why don't you do this for a living? Sure. Whereas if somebody just like picked up a guitar on the weekends and just strummed a few chords, nobody would be like, oh yeah, you should totally like do some gigs. Well, I guess it happens a little bit, but there's something, there's something about art specifically that people really, they can't just accept it as a hobby. <laughs> like, uh, and so we're trying to kind of fight that mentality a little bit more of saying, if you're just a person who wants some form of expression, you just want something, you want a place where you can play, you want a place where you can experiment, you want a place where like, there's, there doesn't have to be wrong choices, then art is a really good opportunity. And so we have most of our classes and our education are based towards beginners and almost all of them uh, don't require any kind of previous knowledge. So we do events all the way from where we go to bars and we'll hang up huge posters and people just paint on the walls. Um, and that's super easy going. Like you just show up and finger paint basically sure. all the way through classes that are a bit more nerdy, a bit more like a nude, a nude figure drawing or silkscreen basics or things like that. But none of these classes necessarily have a prerequisite of knowledge. Uh, we do have classes that, that have that as well, but then we clearly identify this as an intermediate class or an advanced class. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'd say, yeah, most three quarters of our classes are for beginners and it's just literally just sign up and come. This is uh, sounding really interesting. Are you, are you happy with the success of the place? It, has it gone as you wanted? And uh, where next for Blank Space? I... It's hard for me to not be satisfied because it mm. is a phenomenal project that has had such organic growth. Because at the end of the day, what we are, we are just a community of weird people who haven't really found our place in Norway. Like you kind of go into art because you don't really find your your feeling of belonging elsewhere. And so being able to give all these people that opportunity of of fulfillment is there's no way that couldn't be a success. Uh, and I'm really, really proud of all the people who have been a part of this project who maybe a lot of them aren't here still, or a lot of them are still coming. Um, I think one of the things that I'm learning how to do a bit better, cause I, I personally don't have a degree in business or marketing or anything. Like I was an artist and that's what I wanted to do with my life. And so for me, there's a few things that I would like to be learning better about, like how to make money and like how to do a better business plan and how to do better marketing and like, uh, so I can critique myself about a million times about how I wish I was doing better and how I wish the place was had these strategies implemented and whatnot. But Blank Space itself, it is better than I ever imagined it would be. Hmm. Uh, and so I guess short answer, yes, I'm very happy. <laughs> uh, and hopefully the future involves a bit more financial stability because building a community of people who are notoriously poor is a bad financial decision. Uh, and so uh, trying to kind of balance these two worlds of how do we keep a project that is still authentic and still useful and still helpful while also paying my rent uh, since I'm the one here working 40, 60 hours a week. Uh, that's something that we're hopefully going to be cementing a bit more in the, the years to come.
Well, it seems that you've built some solid foundations. So uh, hopefully this podcast will get some more people in the Oslo area coming down and uh, seeing what you have to offer. But uh, a lot of my audience is outside of Norway and they're planning a visit to uh, to the capital. Yeah. What, in terms of art and design experience, can you recommend for people coming to Oslo? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I have too many out-of-the-box suggestions. Um, uh, I mean, because like I was saying before, a lot of the art and design community, it is project-based and it mm. is kind of event-based. And so it's kind of like if you're in the city on this date, uh, then it's, I mean, just go on Facebook and see what's popping up. Um, but there is a few places that have, uh, I can give you like my top three, like solid places. Let's go for it. always has good your, things. Your top three places. <laughs> uh, my favorite place and also to go for art and design is definitely going to be Grafil. That's a G-R-A-F-I-L-L. Now that's the art and design, um, a more illustration and design not union, but uh, interest group, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. uh, and they constantly are doing exhibitions or constantly doing conferences. Um, they're kind of like the the mom of the art and design groups. Uh, they're the one leading the way professionally for all of us. And they're always doing great things. And they're located just downtown next to the, the um, city hall. Mm -hmm. Uh I'm also a really big fan of the Vigulans Park. I know it's really boring to say that because it's like top list of every tourist guide, but it's a beautiful park. <laughs> uh, and I really recommend actually looking at the sculptures and really looking at the very authentic view of the life cycle of, you know, life, death, rebirth, you know, over and over and over again. And not just going, oh, that's a cool sculpture, and then continuing on, but actually looking at what the artist is telling us in pretty clear ways sometimes. <laughs> I think it's extremely like, clear. And also, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's fine to talk about Vigelands Park because it is absolutely one of the best places to visit oh, in Norway. I actually like to visit in the winter. Um, it's oh, so much quieter, but the, yeah. the dark skies, the snow on the ground, for me, it just adds to the, the eerie atmosphere of some of those sculptures. Your third tip then please Liz yeah but see I I shouldn't have said three in the beginning because uh. now I'm now I'm thinking of like what in the world could it possibly be <laughs> and there's there's so many things that pop up uh there is a an organization called Empty Frame mm. and they do quite a few pop-up exhibitions and pop-up events uh live drawing um uh, and so keeping an eye on them maybe and seeing when if, if something's happening with them uh, would be maybe my third suggestion. Okay. Uh, well, we'll put links to all three of Liz's suggestions in the show notes. We are starting to run out of time, Liz, but uh, I will ask you the three questions I ask all guests on the Life in Norway show to wrap right. things up. First question, what's the best thing about living in Norway? Hmm. I think for me, it's a tie. And I know that's cheating. And I'm sorry. Uh, I think the best thing about living in Norway is a combination of the communal mentality of caring about people, uh, want to be helpful. They want, they want you to be happy. Uh, and also the nature. Cause I just, I, boy, I love the nature, the clouds and the mountains and the trees and the fjords and the valleys. And it's sure. incredible. Are you a hiker <laughs> or are you a skier or both? I'm a hiker. Mm. My husband's trying to get me to be a skier, but it's not working very well. <laughs> I hear that story so. a lot. <laughs> okay. But I like the nature, it's nice. Sure. What do you find most challenging about life in Norway? I think the most challenging thing is actually probably what most immigrants share, period, is this idea of, I mean, when you're an immigrant, it's almost synonymous with being an existentialist because you have to refigure so many things out. Uh, you, figuring out who you are in comparison to this new culture, who you are in comparison to what you left behind. I never identified as an American until I moved to Norway. Then I was like, oh my God, you're so American. Oh, uh, I, I completely understand that. I've never felt more British since leaving the island. Yeah. 100%. And so kind of your whole brain goes back to being ooze and then is built back up again. And mm. you have to kind of have this painful process of figuring out exactly who that person is and who you want it to be. 
uh, and going through all that at the same time as figuring out how to do your taxes and how to get a job and how to pay your rent and how to make friends. It's it's complicated. There are a lot of complex uh, conversations to be had about identity and uh, living oh, overseas. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we don't have time to go into that today. No, what? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> my, my guest today has been Liz Ramsey, the director of Blank Space Oslo. Liz, where can people find out more about you and Blank Space? So Blank Space is going to be found at pretty much every social media. Um, all of our tags and websites are the same. So if you just type in blankspaceoslo.com or at Blank Space Oslo, you'll find us. That's great. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful.